Well, good morning, Care to Life. It's another sermon from home, and a lot of people are having to get used to do all sorts of things from home. I sort of wish I could preach topical at this time because I'm right in the middle of chapter 11 of the Gospel of John, and it talks all about death and sorrow, and finally gets into some good news towards the end. But because I preach verse by verse, I'm having to talk about death and sorrow for quite a while and it's a hard subject when it's happening all, all around you but I understand and know that the word of God if we allow it will teach us many things and so I'll just read the verses and then we'll go through it verse by verse and just allow the Holy Spirit to just minister into our hearts and our situations and hopefully we will glean something from that verse 25 of, of chapter 11 Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever believes, sorry, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went away secretly and called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha had met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. We left it last time with Jesus had finished ministering you know, to Martha with those beautiful words, I am the resurrection and the life. And that's the whole focus of this chapter. It's not just all about death and sorrow. It's about resurrection and life. And that's what we as Christians are called to, to, to be at. And so Jesus had got his eyes back on her by giving her that, that, that wonderful statement. And it, it opens up the whole door to everything that who Jesus Christ is and what he's trying to do in, in our life. And thus, I just hope the Holy Spirit will be able to minister to you in this situation and bring you to some of the revelations that uh, he was able to bring to Martha and to Mary. So we'll pick it up from uh, verse 28. And when she had said these things, she went away and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling you. Just point to those last words of hers, the teacher has come and is calling you. Now, Martha had run to Jesus when he was still a far way off and, and he was outside of town. And we saw in that process how wonderfully and lovingly and carefully Jesus ministered to Martha to quieten her spirit, to get her eyes off her grief and all the things that were happening because her brother had died. And he used that last verse, I am the resurrection and the life. But then he said something to her, do you believe this? And she gave this beautiful classic answer. It says, she said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who has come into the world. And I said to you that last time, Jesus had just planted the seed in her because she saw something in him and she was able to vocalise it with her voice. And it must have got into her mind because she was able to do that. But as, as we go through the scripture, you'll see that even though she'd got it in, into her mind, it had not yet taken root and it has not formed into, in, into her heart. And I say that because the things that she says and what transpires, you'll see that she hadn't quite come to the full realisation that he, was, that he was the Son of God. And I want you to remember that first verse. She had said, the teacher has come and is calling you. Now, she didn't say the Lord has come or the Christ has come and is calling you. She said, the teacher has come. In other words, in some translations, it will be rabbi. In her mind, she knew him as Lord, and yet in her heart, she still saw him as being just a, some sort of a teacher or a or a, or a or some sort of a rabbi that 
and yet there's this difference between what was in a mind and what was in a heart. And sometimes out of our heart, words come out. And that's where we're really at. And you'll see that it is very hard sometimes to understand the, the, the actual lordship of Jesus Christ. The revelation of his lordship is not achieved quickly and is not something which comes easily. And as Christians, you'll probably find out and know that all our walk with him is a greater revelation of his lordship in our life. And Martha had just started on that journey. She had spoken these words out and they are, they are words of truth. And yet those words had not permeated down into her heart. Okay, let's have a look at verse 29. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now, we start to see the difference between the two sisters here. I talked about last time the different sort of personalities between Martha and Mary. And they were, they were complete opposites. You know, we find that with, um, yeah, with Mary, she is meek and she is mild. She takes this attitude of sort of holding back. With Martha, she's the opposite. She just goes right at it. She just can't wait. She can't sit still. And they are two different personalities. And we need to be careful here that we don't get mixed up between personalities and what's going on inside someone's heart. Even though they are opposite, Jesus deals with them in, in quite different ways, but not because of their personalities. And you'll find that with Martha, he had to, had to spend quite a lot of time actually talking to Martha and getting her back to that place. But I want you to notice that with Mary, it's not what Jesus says to her, it's what he doesn't say to her. As we go through this bit of scripture, you'll find out that, that Jesus says very, very little you know, to Mary. Now, that wasn't because of her personality. It was because of the place that she was in. And I'll, as I go through, you'll start to understand that because Jesus didn't say much at all to her. And yet he was able to minister to her in a very special way. Now, it says here that Mary had sat and waited patiently at home for Jesus to come. But when she heard that he was coming, it said that she arose quickly. Now, people, we need to be still and wait on God. We hear that scripture over and over again. And most people sooner or later will get up behind the pulpit and say, you know, be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46.10 will say that. And it is a true scripture. We need to be still in the presence of our God to begin to come into that place where we can understand. And also in Psalm 37, it says to wait upon the Lord. It says that about three times in verse 9, 34 and verse 7. We are told to wait upon the Lord and to wait patiently for the Lord. So what does that mean? It means that we have to come into a place where we are waiting for God to do something. Now, if you think about Mary, she was able to do this even in the midst of all her grief and all her sorrow. She was able to sit at home and wait while Martha had run to him. And people with this lockdown that we're in, have you noticed how busy people are? I don't know about your neighbourhood, but everybody around me is just busy hammering and working and walking and talking and building this and doing that and doing this. They just seem to be more active now than they were when they were, you know, before we had the lockdown. And all I can see is people doing this and they're always doing something. I get phone calls from people I haven't heard of from years because they just want to talk, 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 talk. Now, there is something in this busyness which is robbing us. Now, I thought I was pretty good. I'm, I'm, I'm a quiet sort of person. I was sitting back and thinking, well, Lord, I'm not like them. And the Holy Spirit said, yes, you are. You're exactly the same as them. And I suddenly realized that while they were, other people were busy on the outside, I was busy on the inside. My mind works very, very quickly. It doesn't stop from the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep. And my mind, instead of going on as normal pace, was in hyper mode. And in fact, I was so wound up, I remember saying to Julie one day, I'm on overload, I just can't, can't think anymore. 
There was so much information that I was trying to process around and around in my head. Was I being still in the Lord? I was still on the outside. And yet, yet on the inside, I was just like everybody else, running around, trying to not think about what's going on outside and trying to avoid turning inwards and actually being still and waiting on the Lord. And it's very easy to criticise Martha, isn't it? Very, very easy to point the finger and say, well, I'm not like Martha, but there's a bit of Martha in everybody. And I'm quite sure there's a bit of Martha in every one of you out there at the moment. And we need to start listening to the Holy Spirit and be still and know that he is God. Now, Martha waited, but sorry, Mary waited, but what was she waiting for? It doesn't tell us, it's, but she was waiting. And I believe that she was waiting to be called because as soon as she heard from Martha that Jesus wanted to see her, she was up and off and running to, you know, running to him. She was waiting to be summoned by the Lord. She was waiting with expectation that he was coming and she was waiting with expectation that when he came, he would do something and that he would want to see her. And that is the expectation of what it is to wait in the things of God. You see, waiting in God is not something passive. It's not something where we sit down and just say, well, God, you just give me a ring when it's all over, wake me up and I'm, I'm all there. No, it's, a, it's an attitude of our heart and our soul and our spirit where we are actively waiting for God to come into a situation, waiting to hear from him and then being ready to move and ready to move quickly. And that's what, that's what Mary did. When she heard, she got up and she was able to move. And that's a hard thing to do from where she was at. Never forget that she was in the midst of all this grief and in the midst of all this sorrow. And when you're in those positions, all you feel like doing is running and running and running. And yet she waited and waited, knowing that what she, could, she couldn't find the answers to, that Jesus somehow, she knew she, he had the answers and would be able to help her in this situation. Our waiting is not passive, it is active. And in fact, if you look at the Hebrew word for wait, it means to knit together, like twining rope together or knitting, knitting together. It's something in which we be, in our waiting, we become closer and knitted into the things of the spirit and what God is doing. And so it is a very, very active thing. Okay, verse 30. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was still in the place where Martha met him. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I find that quite puzzling. And I ask the question, why? And when I ask the question, why? I end up losing lots of sleep waiting for the answers. But it is worth asking the questions because the Holy Spirit is able to begin to open up situations and scripture to you. Why had Jesus stayed there? It would have been more logical for him to come back with Martha to where Mary was, minister to Mary and then go onto the grave and do all the other things. But Jesus decided to stay where he was. That means that Martha had to come all the way back. Mary had to then go all the way back to Jesus and to where he was. And you have to ask the question, why was he doing this? And as I pondered this situation, I started to see how calmly Jesus moves throughout this whole situation. He was not in a great rush to get back back to Bethany, was he? He actually waited two more days. And, and I talked about all that because of the reasons for it. But even now he's, he's there, but he's not there. He's sitting outside of town and he's waiting. And yet he calmly sits there patiently waiting. But what's he waiting for? And that's the question we need to ask. And I believe that he's not waiting for something, he's waiting for someone, and that's Mary. Mary had not come to him, and yet Jesus was, was, you know, was waiting for, for her. And if you remember the last sermon, it was all about coming to Jesus. We need to come to Jesus. We need to come to him if we want things done, if we want to find out what's going on, if we need help, we need healing. All these things, it always starts with come, come to him. 
And so Mary is back there and Jesus is, is just out of town. And Jesus is waiting for her to come. And I found that sometimes with God, and I see it through Scripture, that God will cross the universe to come to somebody and then just stop short as if he didn't quite get all the distance and he would just wait there. And you have to ask the question, well, why is he waiting? And I believe that he is waiting for that person to come. And that's because God has left us with a choice. We are the ones who must choose whether we come to him or whether we hold back. And we are the ones who choose how close we come to him and how much we hold back from him. And God will never take that choice from you. And that he will always come near enough for you to, to, to know he's there. But you have to move that last little bit. Now, Rob talked about from Revelations. He says, I, behold, I stand at the door and knock. There's another example. Jesus comes right to the door and he could have gone through the door and through the walls, but he stops at the door and knocks. Why did he stop at the door and knock? Because he is waiting for the response of that person. That's the love that he has for us. It is a love which has left us with a free will to choose to love him, to choose to draw near or to hold back. And he will never take that choice from us. And he would not take that choice from Mary. As much as he wanted to be right next to Mary, he left that last bit of distance for her to cross and for Mary to choose. She is the one who must arise. She is the one who must come. And she is the one who must come close to him to close that last bit of distance between her and the one she loved. And as much as she had waited patiently for him, now we have him waiting patiently for her outside of town. And it is a beautiful thing when you start to think about it, that he would not rob her of something so beautiful as letting her come, you know, come to him. And people, that's the same with you today, whether you are saved or whether you're unsaved. God will come as close as he can to you, but he will not take that choice away from you. It's up to you to choose whether you want to come to him. But if you do come to him, then things will happen and things do change. Verse 31. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she is going to the tomb to weep there. It's interesting here where I found that um, Mary and Martha had sort of wanted to do this all in, in private, you know, and Martha had snuck in and I think Mary was trying to sneak out and, and just be with Jesus privately. But I remember reading this and I'm thinking that saying, you know, man proposes and God disposes. Quite often we want to do things privately with God and yet God seems to open up the whole thing for everybody to be involved and as much as you just want it to be just you and him, we end up having the whole town following. And, and I spoke a lot about this. The father had proposed that this last miracle would not be done privately, but publicly. He wanted to make sure that the world knew that his son was who he said he was, that he was the son of God. And so this miracle was to be done publicly and not privately. And so we see here that many followed her. And people, there are going to be times when you're going to want to do things in private and yet God makes them public. And that's just the way it goes. And it's not because of you. It's because of what God wants to do through you and through the situation. And doing it publicly opens up an avenue for God to touch so many people more. There was a great benefit in what he did because it not only helped Mary and Martha but it also helped the many that followed her. It said that all these people came to comfort Mary and there must have been a huge crowd of them because I think this was a very well-loved family and their, yeah, I mean, their, their reason for coming was to comfort you know, these two sisters and I'm and I'm reminded so much of that scripture in Matthew 10, 42. It says, whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of water in the name of a disciple, assuredly, I say to you, he shall by no means lose his, his reward. 
Have you ever noticed that if people bless you, that God blesses them? I've noticed it throughout my whole Christian walk that um, Christian or non-Christian, it doesn't matter to God. If someone blesses you, then God turns around and, and, and blesses them. And God says, even if they give you just, uh, just, a, just a drink of water, then God will still bless them. And we see here that there is this, yeah, this, this, this whole crowd is going to be blessed. But how are they going to be blessed? Well, we find the answer to that in verse 45. It said, then many of the Jews who came to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did, believed in him. And what greater blessing can there be than to know the Saviour? Now, their, their charity didn't save them. But their charity opened up the door for them to see who Jesus Christ was and for them to make that decision whether they would come to him. And many, many did. And you see, they were blessed because they were able, they had this, they had this, this heart in them to go and comfort these sisters. And in that going to those sisters, that opened up that whole door for them. Someone said that, that the... That the secret to being miserable is just to live for oneself. But the secret to finding joy is to live for one another. And people, we live in a time when we should not forget charity. We can turn inwardly in this time and just live for ourselves. Or we can turn outwardly and bring joy to so many people. And we do that because we carry the joy of the Lord in our own hearts. So look at verse 32. Then when Mary had come where Jesus was and she saw him, she fell down at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When you look at these, what she said, she said exactly the same thing as what Martha had said. Well, if you read the English translation, that's what you'll get. And it doesn't matter which translation you, you read, they all say the same thing. The trouble is that um, they didn't say the same thing. If you look at the Greek, you'll see that there is a difference between the actual two sentences and the structure of the sentences. Now, English is a terrible language to translate into. It's a terrible language to try and learn. It's a terrible language to try and understand. And it's even worse when you're trying to come from another language. And what, why is it different? Now, you know with English that two people can say the same sentence to you and it can mean two totally different things. Now, how do we know the difference? We know the difference well, by the tone of the voice, the way that they emphasise certain words, the volume of their voice, their facial expressions, their eye movement. All these subtle things come together and when we hear the sentences, they can mean two completely different things. In the Greek, they are able to do this with the language where the English can't do it. And so there is a difference in what Martha said and what Mary said. It's subtle, but it is still something different. Now, my knowledge of Greek is Alpha uh, and Omega. Everything else in between, I just leave that up to the experts. I'm not a Greek expert. I think I'd rather look at quantum physics and probably understand it far more than I understand Greek. And so I have to trust in what these people, these experts are saying. And I've been in there for a while looking at these things and I come away sometimes more confused than when I first start. But I did come across one translation which seemed to make a little bit more sense. And one person said, it is better translated this way. And this is what Mary says and not what Martha says. Mary said, Lord, if you had been here, had not died my brother. And from what I can gather, it's the way that the, that the pronouns are used, which influence the way the words come, uh, yeah, come over. There is a different emphasis in how Mary used her words as to, as to how Martha used the words. They're, they're just different. And so there was a different thought coming from behind you know, each of the sisters. With, with Martha, she was her thought was that her brother had died and Jesus wasn't there. And she was coming from this, from, you know, from this whole thought about grief that, 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 that her brother had died. Now, Mary was coming from that same place of grief that her brother had died. 
But what she was saying was that she was saying that if Jesus had been there, then her brother could not have died. And there's a big difference. She saw in, in him that nobody could die while he was there. And if you, if you look at scripture throughout the whole three years of you know, Jesus' ministry, there is no record of anyone dying in his presence. And that's what it's going to be like during the thousand year reign. Death will stop because Jesus will be here. And Martha, sorry, Mary had picked up on this. Something in, in, in her spirit had said that you know, if Jesus had just been here, this, would not, this could not have happened because he was who he was. She saw in him, out of all her sorrows, something which was you know, this whole divine nature of, of Jesus Christ. And she was able to say that in what she said. Martha was just speaking from grief. Mary was speaking out of grief, but she still held up Jesus as being who he was, the actual son of God and being divine in, in that situation. And here we have this, this coming out in the way she said it. They are both cries of sorrow, and yet one is a cry of sorrow and worship at the same time. Where did she do this all from? It says that she fell at his feet. She came and she saw him. But then she fell at his feet. Even before she started to speak, she spoke from that position of being at, at his feet. You know, people, we can come, but we can hold back a bit and we can talk and we can question and we can do all these things. But you have to understand that Mary has always seemed to find this place, which is the right place. To come to the feet of Jesus and understanding what this means is not something which is, it's, it's not, it, it's not the physical act of just sitting at his feet which made it so. It was something to do with her heart and her soul and her spirit which put her in the right place. Now three times we read about Mary uh, in the Gospels and every time she's in the same place. The first one we find is in Luke chapter 10 and you all know the story that um, Jesus had, had, had come to the house and Martha was busy as usual running around and and Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus and Martha complained. And what did Jesus say to her? He said to her, Mary has chosen the good part which will not be taken from her. Note the words chosen and would not be taken from her. Mary had chosen something which nobody could take from her, not even Martha. She had got something which was now locked into her spirit and yet, it, it, it could not be taken from her. Now, if you read that, 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 that whole area in Luke, you'll find out that Mary owned Jesus as, uh, as, uh, um, as her prophet sent from God. He was, he was the one that brought the message. And she knew that she had to have this message. It was so important that she heard this message which was coming from this man. And she owned him as her prophet. And she sat at, at, at his feet until that message had got into her heart and into her spirit. Because she knew that message was so important that even getting making her sister angry, you know, it, it didn't matter. She had to have that message. And so she owned him in that way. Now here in this situation, this is the second time that we find her uh, at the feet of Jesus. And she is owning Jesus in a very different way. She doesn't want to hear from him. But she knows that Jesus can do something and go somewhere that she can't go herself. And if you look at that, she is owning Jesus as her high priest. Because Jesus is the only one who can go into death and into sorrow, into these places where she couldn't go. She was in this helpless situation, but she knew that he could do something. She didn't know what. But she understood him as being like her high priest, able to go beyond the veil into the Holy of Holies, to actually go into the presence of God and touch the mercy seat of God and to do something with that. You know, when someone's you know, thrown in jail and they are helpless, the only person that they can ask for help uh, is a lawyer. They're stuck in a jail. They're, they're, they're helpless. They can't go out. They can't do anything. 
The only one that can plead their case is a lawyer. And it's no different to, to Jesus as our high priest. He stands in this legal position for us and he's able to go where we cannot go. And beyond life and into death and into these places. And Mary had picked up on this. And she owned him as her high priest. And she surrendered herself into that. Knowing that he was going to do something. Now later on when we get to chapter 12 you'll see Mary again. And again she's sitting at the feet of Jesus. And that time you'll see that she owns him as her king. And it's another beautiful chapter and we'll get to it. But each time... Because Mary was willing and chose to do something in her heart, to get in that place where she was at the feet of Jesus, a whole dimension of the Lordship of Jesus Christ has been opened up to her. And that would never be taken from her because she chose to be in that place. Now, people, it is not a place which is found in your mind. It's not a place which is found by your action, by just sitting still. It is a place that you can only find when you're in total submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In other words, you've got to the end of yourself and you know that you can't do something, but he can do everything else. And when we are willing to submit ourselves into that place of his Lordship, when we surrender our will and our thoughts and our pain and everything else which is in us at the time, into that situation. We talk about coming to the foot of the cross. This is what it's all about. It is laying down what we have, our fears and everything, and trusting him, trusting in his lordship that he is able to do something. When we find we get into these situations, when our will is surrendered into his will, then we are seated, seated at the feet of Jesus because he then has control. And that's all he waits for. And we have to be willing to trust and know that he's going to do it. You know, Mary fell down at his feet and wept. And sometimes people, that's all we can do. But it's not all that God can do. You know, she couldn't say anything much apart from what she had said. But she did know in her heart that he could do far, far more. I want you to note, and as we go on into this, that Jesus didn't even answer her. Jesus didn't even speak to her. Jesus didn't even give her a word uh, um, yeah, of encouragement, some wonderful scripture or something like that. Nothing was said. And if you ponder on that, you start to understand it. Now, we've been talking about Psalm 91 a lot, and as I said myself, it's been on my heart for over, over a year or more and I've tried to sit in that, in that place. But in Psalm 91, it tells us that we need to press in and to come under the shadow of the Almighty. To find that place where Mary found, where we are in the strong tower. And people, you need to be in the tower. It's not much use running to the tower if you're not going to come in the door and sit outside. But once you're in that place, you'll know what Mary has found. It's a place where words are not necessary. It's a place where the peace of God surrounds you. It's a place where your minds are able to be stilled by his presence, where he touches your heart and softens your heart and puts your heart into that place where it's not pounding at 100 miles an hour, but it's just still and beating with, you know, with, with his heart. It's a it's, it's a place where you feel rested for once. It's a place where you feel comforted and you feel still. And words don't really matter when that comes upon you. And it's not just something uh, which is physical, you know, some emotional thing. It is something which comes into your spirit as well. And you understand and you can just sit there quite securely. And as Psalm 91 says, you know, all these things can be going on either side of you. 10,000 can fall on one side and thousands on the other. All these things. The situation doesn't stand, but you are changed in the situation only because you are in the shadow of the Almighty. I heard a song years ago and I've always loved it. And I understand where this guy was when he wrote it. It says, when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you. 
the guy that wrote that song found the place where Mary found. And it's a place we need to find. We are called to be there in this place, to be still and know the presence of the Lord. Because it's in that place that the Lordship of our Lord can work in our situations. People, people need comforting out there, but unless we are comforted, then how can we comfort others? Unless we know the, the Lordship of Christ in our situation, how can we then take that Lordship out to the rest of the world and explain to them that there is something out there which is far bigger than all this is happening now? A God who loves them and a God that wants to minister to them and a God that wants to bring them safe. Mary made a choice and it wasn't taken from her. And that's the question in I leave you. Do you want to make that choice today? Or do you want to keep running around and running around your head like I was? Or do you want to start to pull in and start to come into that place where the Holy Spirit can draw you in to the feet of Jesus Christ? I want to leave you with a, uh, a bit of scripture that the Lord left with me and I hope it encourages you. It's one that you all know and this time I know where it's from. It's from Isaiah chapter 40. I'll read from verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the heavens, so the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall, utterly, sorry, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and they shall not faint. Bless you all. And I'll just close in prayer. And I pray the Lord will touch you wherever you are and just lead you into his Lordship. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your great love. We don't understand this situation, but we know that you are a God of the situation. And pray, Lord, that those that are suffering in these times, that you are moving close to them, close enough that they might move to you and be touched by you. Help us, Lord, to be still in this time. Help us to find what Mary found. Help us to know your Lordship in this time. And out of that Lordship and out of our position in you, Father, I pray that you might be able to use us to comfort this world in this time and give them the hope that they need because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless you all.